Hi there, Steve Kaufman here. So today I uh, want to answer a question that I get all the time in a little more detail than I have been able to do. Question is, how many languages do you speak? So I'm going to go through my languages and how well I think I speak them. And then as an experiment, I'm going to speak a bit of Russian towards the end. I say an experiment because I don't know how, how I'm going to do because I basically haven't done anything in Russian for literally years. So my languages, obviously English I speak the best, followed by French. And I think that my French, I don't know what qualifies as C2, but that would be the language that I would put forward where I am closest to C2, where I'm so proficient that I can read literature, understand movies. I, I mean, for three years I studied there, I wrote my exams in French, I had oral exams in French. I mean, it's, it's the language that I, that I control the best, all right? So that's number two. Number three is Japanese, where I lived for nine years, and I used it in business all the time. Uh, I spent a lot of time initially, you know, listening and reading, and I've mentioned this before, I got a hold of some NHK tapes on the history of the Showa era, which I listened to over and over and over again. I did a lot of reading, mostly uh, using textbooks that I was able to find where they had a vocabulary list behind each lesson, and there were some very advanced readers of Japanese literature, history, philosophy with word lists, and so I did a lot of work with Japanese, but I lived there for nine years and just had so many business meetings, lengthy discussions, lengthy negotiations, lengthy conversations about everything, history, philosophy, you name it, all in Japanese. So Japanese is number three, and maybe I'm a C1 in Japanese, I don't know. A lot of these things are quite uneven. I, I can't write by hand in Japanese, but I can type on a typewriter. Uh, my written Japanese would simply be spoken Japanese put in writing. So let's say I'm a C1 there. Chinese comes next, Mandarin Chinese, because I studied it full time. And then I was in and out of China as a Canadian government trade commissioner. I had a lot of interaction with Chinese people here in Vancouver. I've done a lot of listening to uh, Xiang Sheng, uh, this is Chinese comic dialogues. Uh, and other material that I have in Chinese. So, and I probably use Chinese more than any other language. Uh, my wife and I were recently in Greece, in Crete, with a Chinese couple. We were speaking Chinese every day in the car, visiting museums, having dinner, and so forth and so on. So, Chinese would be number four. And number five would be Spanish. Uh, and there, um, basically, I had a, a Spanish co course at McGill. Uh, but didn't really learn that much. But then I was, you know, when I was a student in France, I used to hitchhike in Spain, spent a lot of time traveling. And then more recently, well, my wife and I had visited Spain, so I've spoken Spanish there. And I got very interested in improving my Spanish, so I bought a lot of books. Uh, I remember the first Spanish book that I read from cover to cover was a book about national identity in Spain by a Basque person something or other, El Bosque, I don't remember the name, but uh, you know, part of my strategy was to read more. And, and so when you read your first book in a foreign language, to me, that's like a big deal. The same when learning Chinese, I read, you know, Loto Xianzo, the uh, you know, rickshaw boy in Chinese. So it's, it's important to read your first full book in the language. And I did that in Spanish. I did a lot of work at Link in Spanish where you have audiobooks. So just to improve my vocabulary. So those I consider my top five. Now we drop off a little bit. And I think probably next, uh, there are two languages that I speak fairly fluently, but I have a more limited vocabulary, and that's uh, Swedish and German. And, but I did a lot of business in Sweden. I spent a lot of time listening to Swedish audiobooks, Hermann Lindqvist, reading his books on the history of Sweden. Did a lot of business in Sweden, have spoken a lot of Swedish. Similarly with German, I went through a period back in 1987 where I scoured secondhand bookstores in Vancouver to find books with, in those days we didn't have online dictionaries, we didn't have links, so I sought out readers, books with little glossaries behind each chapter, and I did a lot of listening, listening and reading. I found these wonderful audio cassettes in German 
interviews on radio stations, natural German speaking. I did a lot of listening and then ultimately traveled to Germany many times in the 90s on business, sat with my agent in the car for hours and hours in the uh, Autobahn, which was often blocked. So I spoke a lot of German. So German and Swedish would be next, so that's six and seven. Then probably would be Italian. Although I haven't really spoken it a lot, but I have listened to Il Narratore, the uh, audiobook producer out of Italy. And I've listened to I Promessi Sposi, I've listened to Pinocchio done by him. I really recommend it, by the way, Il Narratore, you can look it up. Uh, so I did a lot of work on my uh, Italian. I also once went through a linguophone uh, thing in Italian. And uh, it's just that it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of Spanish sneaks into my Italian, but I have no trouble understanding, communicating. But, but it's not a slam dunk. Like, I had to put a lot of effort into it. I've done a lot of listening to uh, uh, Rai, the radio, uh, national radio broadcast, Rai Due, Aleotto della Sera. Uh, so I have put effort into it, and it'll probably, it would be number uh, eight. Then it would be probably Portuguese. There again, uh, it wasn't a slam dunk. I uh, initially, uh, before we had Portuguese at Link, I uh, used living language, went to Portugal. Nobody spoke to me in Portuguese. They just reverted to English. But then we, I worked on it at Link. I had a tutor in uh, Belo Horizonte in uh, Brazil. I listened to hundreds of hours of Portuguese podcasts, RTF out of Portugal. And then when I went back to Portugal, lo and behold, I was able to carry on conversations in Portuguese. Again, Spanish sneaks into my Portuguese, but that would be sort of number nine. And number 10, probably Cantonese, uh, although I would need to refresh it a bit, but I can naturally switch into Cantonese. So those would be the top 10. Now we move on to 11, which would be Russian. And Russian is part of those languages that I've learned um, Basically, well, Portuguese as well is, is something that is, you know, since the age of 60. Uh, but I had a head start because of Spanish. Now, Russian was something I decided to study at the age of 60 because people said you can't learn Russian if you don't spend a lot of time with the grammar and I want to prove, wanted to prove them wrong. Plus, I wanted to read, you know, uh, Russian novels in the original. So I spent Oh, you know, four or five years. I mean, I remember I started, I think, in 2006, 2007, maybe. So more than, uh, yeah, around the age of 60. And uh, it was a while before. And I, I started with, you know, beginner material, uh, books that I could find, audio stuff at Link. Uh, I probably went uh, a couple of years before speaking. Uh, fairly quickly, I got into audio books. I remember going to Riga because we were doing business, lumber business in Riga, and buying uh, audiobooks there. And uh, I remember discovering these wonderful Soviet era films. And I had this tremendous period of involvement with Russia, and uh, excuse me, with Russian and Russian culture and literature, and it was lovely. And I'm gonna to try to speak some Russian at the end here, but after Russian, then it goes. And so the Russian, I can kind of cope, although I haven't spoken very much. I, I visited Russia for 12 days, uh, I have spoken, you know, perhaps over the years at Link, maybe, I don't know, as many as 100 hours with our tutors. Uh, but it's it's still not a language that I have spoken a lot, so I, I struggle. And especially since now I haven't done any Russian for, I don't know, three, four years, it's, 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 it's going to be a bit of a struggle. But after Russian, I did Czech, uh, and the Czech is even more of a struggle. But again, if I get in the environment, then I'm okay but difficult to just turn it on. The same with certainly Polish, Ukrainian better because I was in Ukraine, I was in Lviv for a total of three weeks and speaking a lot of Ukrainian. So I've actually spoken more Ukrainian, much more Ukrainian within the last few years than Russian. So 11 is Russian, 12 in terms of my level would be Ukrainian. Then comes Czech, Slovak, Polish. Slovak again, I have a bunch of stuff in Slovak that I listen to, but it's very similar to Czech and probably when I speak, I'll be, uh, whether I go Yak or Aku, you know, and, and <laughs> different things that change, but it's very, very similar. Then once we get beyond that, now I'm in trouble. Uh, Romanian, I have, I mean, I, when I listen to it, when I hear it, I understand a lot, but to try and speak, very difficult. Greek, 
when I was in Greece, I managed quite well and was complimented, but they're very polite, you know. But I have enough of a base in both Romanian, oh, I forgot Korean. Korean is a language where I actually have a large vocabulary and I can, I can speak, but I just don't, haven't reached that level of, of fluency. I am certainly not fluent in Korean, but I understand a lot. So I would say that Korean, Romanian, Greek are languages that I need to work on, but I have a sufficient critical mass of vocabulary and comprehension then I can go back to them and build them up. And if I were to go to the country within a few weeks, I would be quite comfortable. And then I have Arabic at the end.